say, well, there we are, the tiered system's now working, I'm going to stick with it, that would be one thing. But the Prime Minister is now saying, I'm going to do the lockdown. That's failure. Yeah. That's failure. Yeah, yeah. And the next four weeks cannot be wasted. Cannot be wasted. We have got to fix, test, trace and isolate. The last figures, the last figures show that in just one week, 113,000 contacts were missed by the system. Four in ten people who should be contacted are not being contacted under the system. If you're not contacted, you cannot isolate. That's 113,000. It's not just a number. That's 113,000 people walking around our communities when they should have been self-isolating. Hands up if you think that's helped to control the virus. We've been on about the track, trace and isolate system for months. The promises come by the wheelbarrow, the delivery never. Only 20% of people who should be isolating are doing it. Something is going wrong, just continually pushing away challenge. Pretending the problem doesn't exist is a huge part of the problem. And those figures have got to turn around, and they've got to turn around in the next four weeks, because if we get to the 2nd of December, and those problems are still in the system, we will be going around this circuit for many, many months to come. If this isn't fixed in the next four weeks, there are massive problems. The government's also got to stop sending constant mixed mix messages. Go back to work. Even if you can work from home, civil servants get to work. Only a week later to say, stay at home. The constant changing of economic plans is creating even more uncertainty. There have been huge mistakes made in recent weeks during this pandemic. We've been told so many times by the Prime Minister, often on a Wednesday afternoon, there's a plan to prevent a second wave. It's working. Well, there wasn't, and it didn't. And now, less than four months after the Prime Minister told us that this would all be over by Christmas, we're being asked to approve emergency regulations to shut the country down. That's a terrible thing for the country to go through. But there isn't any excuse for inaction or for allowing the virus to get further out of control. So Labour will act in the national interest and we will vote for these restrictions, these regulations tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to members, we're going to start with a four minute limit and I start with Theresa May. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first of all say to my right honourable friend that I don't envy him and the government the decisions that they're having to take, take and the difficult and the difficult positions that they uh, find themselves in. This pandemic has challenged governments across the world and ministers have been under relentless pressure in dealing with this issue. But just as ministers are making tough decisions, so are Parliament. And Parliament will make better decisions if it is fully and properly informed. I want to comment on the circuit breaker idea because I looked at the SAGE paper of the 21st of, December, of, of September and what was absolutely clear was this was not a two to three week circuit breaker, full stop, end of story. It would have had to have been repeated, possibly again and again and again, and I doubt if any economy could have, have borne the irreparable damage that would have done with the impact on lives that that would have had, which would have been significant. Uh, I, of course, the government introduced the tiered approach, and I would echo the comments made by my right honourable friend, the member for the Forest of Dean, that one of the issues with the tiered approach is that we haven't had a proper analysis of how that has uh, the impact that that has had. The evidence is from Liverpool that hospital that uh, cases are falling. I raised this in a briefing the other day and was told that was because yes. students, fewer students were coming forward to be tested. But when you look at the figures, actually the number of cases is falling across the age ranges. Yes. We need to have that proper assessment of how that tier system is working. But there are other examples of where figures have been used in a way that I think has been unhelpful to Parliament and to the public. Let me take the 4,000 figure. It yes. appears that the, the uh, decision to go towards this lockdown um, was partly, mainly, to some extent, based on the prediction of 4,000 deaths a day. Yet if you look at the trajectory shown in that graph that went to 4,000 deaths a day, we would have reached 1,000 deaths a day by the end of October. Now, the average in the last week of October was 259 by my, my calculation. Each of those deaths is a sadness, and our thoughts are with the families. 
but it is not a thousand deaths a day. So the prediction was wrong before it was even used. And this leads to a problem for the government, because it is, for many people, it looks as if the figures are used to, uh, chosen to support the policy rather than the policy being based on the figures. So we need these proper analyses. I say that to my right honourable friend. We need to know the details behind these models. We need to be able to assess the, the validity of those models. But there's one set of data that has not been available throughout, and that is a lack of data about the costs of the decisions that are being taken. Costs for non-COVID non treatment in NHS, non-COVID deaths, domestic abuse, uh, mental health, possibly more suicides, and of course, cost to the economy. Jobs lost, livelihoods shattered, businesses failing, yep. whole sectors damaged. What sort of airline industry are, you going, are we going to have coming out of this? What sort of hospitality sector? How many small independent shops will be left? The government must have made this analysis. They must have made this assessment. Let us see it and make our own judgments. I just want to, to make one word about public worship and echo the concerns of others. My concern is that the government today, making it illegal to conduct an act of public worship for the best of intentions, sets a precedent that could be misused for a government in the future with the worst of intentions. And it has unintended consequences. The uh, remembrance, COVID Secure Remembrance Service in Worcester Cathedral is now going to be turned into a pre-recorded online service. Surely those men and women who gave down their lives for our freedom deserve better than this. The public and parliament want to support the government to take the right decisions. To do that, we need to have the right figures, the right data, and the proper information. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have now the SNP spokesperson, Patrick Grady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, and congratulations yeah, yeah. on your anniversary. I should say, in the SNP, we're not uh, unused to the Prime Minister scuffling out before our yes. spokesperson gets to their feet, but the fact that he couldn't spend four minutes to listen to his predecessor, I think, is extremely yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. and like her, I want to acknowledge the personal tragedies and loss of life caused by the pandemic and extend our condolences yeah. to everyone who's lost a loved one this year. And I want to be as brief as I can because none of us want to deny the 48 Tory backbenchers who are lined up on the call list uh, to make their views known to their own government. And perhaps even more, incidentally, would be taking part if the government was allowing members to continue to contribute virtually yeah. in this chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asking members to travel uh, to the public, uh, asking members to travel hundreds of miles to Westminster while the public are being asked for home is increasingly untenable and it puts too many yeah, staff yeah. at this House at risk. Yeah. And perhaps it suits the government not to hear from its own backbenchers who are in high-risk categories, constituencies yeah. or households. And in any event, Mr Speaker, if the evil standing orders hadn't been suspended uh, during the pandemic, this motion would be subject to the double majority procedure, which would have the effect of negating any votes cast by MPs from Scotland. Um, so I can confirm that the SNP won't be taking part in any division that arises on this motion, and that probably gives the government some comfort in the lobbies. And that's because the development and implementation uh, of public health policy is devolved across the United Kingdom, and it's right that the relevant legislatures make decisions for their areas and do not interfere in the decisions of others. But the Tory government's continued delays and obfuscation on the provision of economic support, especially for job retention and furlough, has effectively interfered yeah. with the ability of the devolved administrations yeah. to make the decisions that they might have yeah. wanted to. So even if we're not voting on the motion before us this evening, we have to use this opportunity to press the government yeah. yet again, because the obfuscation is continuing, even at Prime Minister's questions, Absolutely. even in the responses of the Prime Minister to my honourable friends who intervened on him. On Monday, um, to members across the House from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, the Prime Minister it kept saying that furlough was UK-wide. Then conveniently, in response to the Honourable Member for Murray, he said of course furlough would, support, would be available whenever the devolved administrations need it. And then today at Prime Minister's questions he said, well we have to wait for the Chancellor to make a statement yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. And he repeatedly says, oh the SNP won't take yes for an answer. We'll take yes for an answer when it's put in writing to the Scottish Government yeah, and it's yeah, clear yeah, yeah. and unambiguous. Well, this Tory yeah. Government has to urgently engage with the devolved administrations yeah. in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland yeah. and confirm 
that if any of these governments move all or part of their territories into lockdown level restrictions with the closure of non essential retail, hospitality, and leisure, that funding will be available on the current furlough terms for employers to retain staff at 80 per cent of their wages. Yeah, yeah. The Scottish Government is also still waiting for clarity on Barnet consequentials as a result yeah. of increased spending yeah. for English local government, and there is still no clarity on whether the unlimited payments for business support in England will be made available on a similar demand-led basis for Scotland. So this has to come in writing on usual channel terms from the Chancellor before he gets up and makes a statement in the House tomorrow. As I said to the Prime Minister in the Chamber on Monday, his furlough scheme is in place across the UK until December of this year. The equivalent scheme in Germany is in place until December 2021. Yeah. That is the kind of certainty that employers and employees alike are crying out for. That is the kind of certainty that businesses need to plan for and adapt to a health and economic crisis that will not go away anytime soon which is why the government has to use this time wisely and well. It must use the period of heavier restrictions to work with the devolved administrations to improve test and trace across the United Kingdom, to make sure that capacity and support gets to where it is needed in the four health services, and it has to put in place provision to support businesses and the economy in a way that will provide certainty for however long the crisis lasts. Here, here. Mr Speaker, I want to acknowledge, as the First Minister of Scotland has repeatedly done, that lockdown is tough. Yeah. There are hard times behind us and there are hard times ahead, and all of us in the SNP want to say thank you. Thank you to our amazing NHS and social care workers, yeah, yeah. to others on the front line. Thank you to the business owners that are being forced to close, to their employers, their, empl their employees sorry, who are making huge sacrifices, yeah, yeah. to the excluded who have had no support whatsoever from this government exactly. and are still holding their heads high. Yeah, yeah. So the rules that are being enforced in England today Three and the restrictions million. that are in place Three elsewhere in the UK million. are difficult, but they are necessary. Exactly. They help us to protect ourselves, they undoubtedly help us to protect our loved ones and those around us, and they help wider communities. They definitely help to protect our NHS and ultimately they help to save lives. So we thank everyone making sacrifices to follow these restrictions, and together we will get through this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice one, Patrick. Mr. Speaker, can I say that I agree with what the Honourable Member for Glasgow North was saying in giving thanks and in recognising the sacrifice that many have made in their lives, in their work, and in their relationships. Where the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister agree on these regulations, I shall agree as well. Were it possible to put down amendments, I would have done. I have been to three church services recently. One was for a funeral, one was morning service on Sunday, and the other was the monthly communion in St Margaret's, where I am the parliamentary warden. All of those were COVID safe. I believe that if we have to come back to this again, government ought to be able to find a way, with the faith leaders, uh, the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, and other faith groups, as to how they can provide at least a, a body of people together with the celebrant and others may then participate remotely. Uh, if I can also say that for 34 years, Pamela Carrington, who's looked after successive rectors of St Margaret's Westminster, is retiring. I paid tribute to her this morning, and I hope it may be possible that in future, Mr Speaker, we could ask you to make a presentation to Pamela Carrington in recognition of all the support she's given to members of Parliament, and we can thank you for letting us use your dining room in normal times for our monthly breakfast too. For these regulations, there's a provision for the centenary of the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior in Westminster Abbey. I'm glad that's been built in and, and that was thoughtful. And perhaps as a result of the work of Cox and Ian Mackenzie in my constituency, who raised the question of the Submariners Association Memorial on the embankment, that the provision for remembrance uh, attendance appropriately and safely is in these regulations. I give support to that. I want to come to the points where I believe we've not got it right. I do believe that two people playing tennis, separated by a net, can do so safely, and as safely as they can if they went for a walk. I think the golf uh, restrictions are unnecessary. There's obviously a responsibility on the club or the provision of the premises, but I think that should be possible. If I can go for a walk with a dog, or, or be taken for a walk with a cat, or fly after my um, parrot, I haven't got any of those, uh, I think I ought to be able to go around with the, the golf club as well. And there are interesting questions as to whether swimming, as long as you don't have infection risks in changing rooms, can be safe. Uh, 
In fact, basically, all these separated sports, I think, should be allowed. But the more, more intimate ones, like wrestling, I can see the problem with, and other recreations of that kind. But I believe that we ought to be able to make provision for people to, to get exercise, doing the kinds of things that they... I, I give away a wrestler. <laughs> But on physical activity, I, I, I'm very grateful for, uh, for giving way. I've just heard um, from councillors in my constituency that under the restrictions, a skate park for young people has got to be closed. How can this be sensible when young people need something to do when actually it'll just end up being damaged while it's closed, while they're trying to break into it? They can socially distance and, and, and have physical activity, which is also good for their mental health. Mm. I, I hope that the, the Secretary of State for Health will pass that on to relevant people and see if they can make provision and give guidance. Obviously, there are going to be boundary problems. Going from one side of saying yes to one side saying no ought to have a space in between where, under conditions, it's possible. We all have to accept responsibility for contributing to the reduced social contact, the reduced chance of risk. But I think that if we do those things, we can learn from what we've done in the past, we can do it better in the future, and I hope that this, uh, in effect, month of restrictions has the effect that we all want it to, to achieve. I want to finish by saying that we aren't just looking at these regulations. And incidentally, I still criticise the government for using the COVID provisions to bring forward the regulation to put extra stories on leaseholders' blocks of flats. I think that was improper, it wasn't necessary, and it shouldn't have happened. I return to the last point, which the Chancellor and others will be dealing with, which is what is the compensation going to be to those who are affected, who aren't getting support? The people in the events industry, whether in music or exhibitions or the like, the people in the freelance sector, which has been a growing part of our economy for the last 20 years, who seem to be hung out to dry. And for those who have started new businesses, because we know that four out of five new businesses don't last, those who have started new businesses in the last year or so seem to be excluded. I believe we have a duty to do more for those people <laughs> The excluded should be included. Graham Stringer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I will not be supporting uh, the government in these regulations uh, in the lobby uh, later on this afternoon uh, for two reasons. Uh, well, there are two reasons uh, for a lockdown. One is to save lives and the other one is to buy time to improve the situation. I don't believe that when one looks at the details that the government have either provided the information necessary uh, to vote on those uh, issues, or secondly, one can have any faith that they will improve the situation as we have it at the present time. The, my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, gave a devastating case of the incompetence of the government over this uh, period. If we look at saving lives, the problem is, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have had exaggerated uh, claims, both by the government and some of the scientific advisers, about the consequences of not uh, having a lockdown. And undoubtedly, people are dying of this dreadful disease. But we have not been given the other side of the equation. We have not been told how many people will die of cancer and various other treatments. We've not been told how many people uh, are likely to commit suicide. In order for us to take a decision in the round, we need both of those figures. We need the figures for the economic catastrophe that is happening in my constituency and other parts of the country because of uh, the lockdown and the long-term consequences on uh, jobs for the people that we are, all represent. So that's one side. We simply don't have uh, the information uh, about uh, that. In terms of improving the situation, we have a national test and trace system that doesn't work. And it doesn't work because the government doesn't want it to work. It doesn't work because it is fundamentally flawed. If you have a system where contracts are given out to private companies beforehand and they need to be nimble on their feet and act quickly in order to respond to a particular outbreak, often the contracts can't respond to that. There was a case in the centre of Manchester uh, where uh, the central test and trace system walked off site because the contract 
said they didn't have to work after 10 o'clock. Simply, the central system won't work. They can't pass the information on within time. The responses are getting back to people who can do something about it in over three days. I talked to the North West Regional Health people uh, earlier this week, and they said their time for returning the information was over three days, where if people are going to infect other people, then the time uh, has gone. It doesn't work because it's centralised. The history of public health in this country is of decentralisation, where local people can go, find out where there is a problem, whether it's in a school, a factory, a street, and do something about it, test and get people to isolate. The central system won't work. If I believe the government were going to improve it over that uh, period, then I might be tempted uh, to vote for this. Uh, uh, re these regulations, but they are not. The government have failed to give us information, not just on the economy and on the other side of the equation, the damage caused to, to people's health. They have failed to give us the information on what is happening on, in the health service. So I cannot join them in the lobby this evening. Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Deputy Speaker, <coughs> I, um, I rise in sadness really today because I simply have to say to the government I cannot support them tonight. And I just want to make the reasons why that is the case. I want to say to my honourable friend, right honourable friends, he knows I supported him enormously in every task that he's had, and I stand behind him on most of these charges. It's difficult. The government faces the most terrible uh, compromises and consequences, uh, and I feel obviously for them, and I want to, them to succeed. But I do feel that today we are taking arguably the second largest decision that any government has taken since the Second World War. The first one was back in March, the second one is now, and that is to lock down an economy which plunges individuals and people, businesses, into a terrible state of lost jobs. Uh, and we're doing it on the basis of uh, Sage's advice on the Friday and Saturday, well, the Friday night, I say, before it was leaked uh, for Saturday. Uh, I want to say I thought the leak is appalling, uh, that the, whoever did it should be sacked, strung up to dry, come here to apologise, grovelled out the door on hands and knees, uh, and beaten on the way out, frankly. Because, to be honest with you, this is appalling, what they have done. It's appalling because uh, what they did was bounce the government. And they bounced the government because I'd like to think that the government would have then spent its time investigating the data that was being presented to them that has now subsequently unravelled in the last few days. I would have loved the government to have looked at this carefully and understood that, for example, when uh, the SAGE start talking about 4,000 deaths to be reached by December, it's now quite clear that even uh, uh, Professor uh, Witte has said uh, yesterday, I think all of us would say that the rates would probably be lower than the top peak I think there's been some rather overblown rhetoric on this. Well, it was their overblown <laughs> rhetoric, in case he missed the point. And the reality about this is that that figure has turned out <coughs> to be incorrect. Professor Tim Spector of King's College uh, London has said <coughs> that the rate now is at uh, one, he believes, for falling after some plateauing. And there is good evidence uh, that across the board, uh, the tier system is beginning to work. And I simply say to my right honourable friend, and I'm sorry, by the way, that uh, our right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, wasn't able to stay for uh, uh, um, our right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, uh, but he must have been busy. But uh, my point is that she was making the point that I want to make now, which is many of these tests, which my right honourable friend had said previously, uh, have been looked at before the tier system has a chance to bite. I thought that what the Prime Minister did back in October when he chose to go for a tier system was brave. It was brave because Sage was arguing for a circuit breaker. By the way, I hate circuit breaker. It's a euphemism that is appalling. It's not a circuit breaker, it's a business breaker. And as the Prime Minister himself said, it's a very, very big decision. And it's a decision that damages lives. And the people that will be damaged by this will be the poorest in society. They will be damaged because they lose their jobs. The loss of a job is not just an income problem. It's self-respect. It's a, a status. It's, it's what you do. It's how you stand up in front of your family <clears throat> and show them that you are bringing, as it were, the money back to the house uh, and improving their lot. All of these are damaging. And this decision, I believe, was not necessary now. I believe the government can use the circuit, uh, rather the, uh, the tier system, 
to make sure that we do press down on it. And the evidence from all those areas that we have looked at, Liverpool and the North West, is that we are beginning to see this come down. Further pressure on this, I believe, would work. All the data now that is unravelling, I'm afraid, is unravelling on the basis that now we move to a full lockdown, the damage on the economy is enormous. Can I simply ask my right honourable friend this as I close? Can we now please have that economic impact assessment urgently to show what the damage will be to our economy, the livelihoods, the lives and the people's well-being and mental status? But I will oppose it tonight. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I want to set out some concerns I have about these regulations, primarily because I believe the economic pain on my constituency uh, will be inflicted on my constituency and a hardship on my constituents. The unintended health consequences of the first lockdown and the government's lack of a plan to deal with the backlog, and then the government's failure of testing, not least because it decided to hand it to the private sector. I only have to remind the House, uh, Madam De Deputy Speaker, of the Prime Minister's quote uh, in his response to uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Holborn and St Pancras, when he said on the 20th of May, we will have a test, track and trace operation that we will be beating. And yes, it will be in place by the 1st of June. The government has introduced four changes to the local restrictions for September before the tiered restrictions were introduced and passed in this House on the 13th of September. And don't forget they were supposed to be reviewed next week on the 11th of November. It did not allow enough time to assess uh, if they were working. It appears they might have been because we've seen a notable improvement in the rate of infection in Merseyside and Holton. I spoke to my hospitals on a regular basis and I know they're under a great deal of pressure and I know what a fantastic job everybody who works there is doing. Uh, and, and, and I continue to keep an eye on that. The government sets out in its regulations uh, in the section on vulnerable persons and disability that uh, the vulnerable people will be any person aged 70 or older or any person aged under 70 who has underlying health conditions. So if the government believes rightly that it's important to list the meaning of a vulnerable person but does not set out how it will specifically protect this group, this is quite shocking. Uh, given the group of people make up a significant proportion of patients admitted to hospital with COVID um, and this vulnerable group must be better protected to save lives and ease some pressure on our hospitals. They tell me that they simply cannot afford to live on £95.85 £95, pence a week and are having to choose between putting their health at risk from COVID or their health at risk from not being able to afford to get the things they need. They are frightened and going to work. This government should be focusing on everything possible on this clinically vulnerable group. Instead of sensibly shielding our most vulnerable, why are the government closing businesses that there is no evidence to support are responsible for the spread of COVID? There is no reliable evidence for, for closure of gyms, stopping golf and tennis, for example. There is no evidence they are responsible for spreading COVID. In coming to its decision, the government does not appear to take into account how many organisations and businesses have invested large amounts of money to become COVID safer. But that was, of course, not the case for prior to the first lockdown. And where is the evidence that churches are a significant lift? Constituents tell me going to mass better helps them. There is no evidence. And we see today in, in the press report that the ONS figures showing so many more people uh, getting paid below the minimum wage. Many are, are, are younger people, low paid people in the hospitality and service industry. Now, the government, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Health three times from the April this year to ask him to put Holton forward as an ideal place for mass testing. My request has been ignored. He now talks about Liverpool, we now know Liverpool uh, is being chosen to be a mass testing area. But although the city region, we are included as that in terms of t tier three restrictions, we've not been included in the testing. And I asked the Secretary to state why Halton is not being included in the mass testing. Now, there are plenty of people on the waiting lists, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, who have missed by quite considerable time the 18 weeks target. And that ranges from a re that range of uh, conditions, whether it's cancer and coronary disease, or whether it's gynaecology. There are significant numbers of my constituents who have not been seen or been treated in time. And this may mean that some people who have treatable conditions may, be, may not be treatable in the future. <coughs> there is real suffering going on in my constituency and of course the mental effect on mental health. I cannot support these reg regulations as they, are, as they stand, Madam Deputy Speaker. Dr Andrew Morrison. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by apologising um, for reading a newspaper 
uh, during the Prime Minister's contribution. He's quite right. However, I wasn't, in my defence, reading my horoscope, even if the Prime Minister very clearly, uh, very, very kindly uh, did. Um, I wonder, though, in mitigation, whether I could bring to your attention uh, the uh, headline that I was reading in the Metro uh, this morning, which says vaccine on the front line in a month. And just imagine my excitement at reading that. I hope the Metro is correct, but I would gently point out to the front bench that in the event that it is not correct, in the event that we don't get a game changer soon, we are seriously going to have to think about a plan B. And in the few minutes available to me, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I shall explain why I think that is the case. <clears throat> Irrespective of the Prime Minister's kind remarks about my future career prospects, I uh, will be uh, supporting the Government this evening. I can't think of a single issue since 2003 that has occupied me quite as much as this, and I have agonised over my choice. I'm going to support the Government uh, really because it hinges on one thing for me, and that is that schools are remaining open, something I've discussed with the Secretary uh, of State. In the light of evidence produced by Ackland et al. in Edinburgh, it seems to me it would be foolhardy uh, to close down schools based uh, around deaths uh, to, to do with COVID, but also the consequentials of such uh, an extraordinary move. It's the right decision to keep them open. It's the right decision to prioritise schools, and it is for that reason that I will be supporting the government this evening. I will also be supporting the government this evening because it seems to me that, broadly speaking, it's doing the same thing uh, that other, other jurisdictions are doing, and their safety in numbers. I'll be supporting the government this evening, too, because of the wide margin of uncertainty that attends all of this and a sense, if I may say so, of some humility in trying to examine all this complicated material and making sense of it. And finally, I should be supporting the government, if I may say so, because I know the Prime Minister, because he shares many of the libertarian instincts that I hold, has pushed back as much as he can on some of the advice that has been given to him. I find that convincing, and that, if I was in any uh, doubt, having anal analysed the data over the weekend, I would say has pushed me over the line in the decision I have made. But I'm concerned about clarity of data. I'm concerned about the logistic ch logis logistics change for the vaccine that the Metro hopes very much will be with, with us within a month. And the Secretary of State knows I'm concerned because I have some granular evidence from my own constituency that, in fact, those organisations that can provide the wherewithal to guarantee that cold chain necessary for the distribution of the vaccine has not yet been tapped into. And I cite particularly the company Polar in my constituency in that respect, which is a leader in this particular technology and has yet to be uh, contacted. I'm concerned about lack of Plan B. Plan B, Secretary of State, uh, that of course has been made all the more possible uh, by the advent of lateral flow testing technology which will facilitate, if necessary, focused protection, and we need to give much closer <laughs> thought to that. I'm concerned about collective, places of collective worship. I'm concerned about sports that are non-contact sports, tennis, golf, and so on. I know uh, that I understand the logic behind uh, proscribing those activities, but we have to treat the British public as adults yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and individuals with autonomy yeah. and agency. And I respectfully disagree uh, with the decisions that have been made on those fronts. And I hope very much, particularly if this sadly uh, has to be continued beyond uh, the beginning of December, uh, that those are looked at again. Manira Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I've been feeling quite emotional today, not just because of the news coming from the US, but because of the gravity of what we are being asked to debate and vote on today. Having only been uh, an MP for 11 months, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be asked to make a decision like this. I'm horrified by the regulations that I'm, uh, I'm being asked to vote for today. I'm horrified by the impact that these restrictions will have on people's lives, their mental health and their livelihoods. I'm horrified by the upward trajectory that we're seeing in infection and hospitalisation rates and the bleak projections that so many experts have presented to us. And I'm horrified that we're even being put in this position in the first place by a government that I feel has dithered and delayed when we might have had a second, shorter lockdown sooner while schools were closed for half term to try and get the virus under control. I'm horrified that despite the warnings 
from the Academy of Medical Sciences that I put to the Secretary of State back in July to address, ad address the test and trace system, these warnings were not acted on. And that alongside all these draconian and damaging measures that we are being asked to support uh, today, and indeed which I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues feel we have absolutely no option but to uh, vote through, there is not a shred of evidence that the government is going to use this lockdown to, uh, time wisely to address the deficiencies in the main weapon that we have until a va vaccine comes along, which is to test, trace and isolate every case to keep people safe and to keep our economy going. We hear a lot about testing, but nothing on boosting contact tracing rates by allow allowing local authorities to lead the tracing as they have so effectively proved they can do and properly supporting in both practical and financial ways those who need to self-isolate. Even the Prime Minister has finally acknowledged that the sub-20% isolation rates are a major problem. Whilst I and others on this side of the House have been making the, the, the case for these measures for some time, I'm pleased that finally Conservative members, not least the health, former Health Secretary and the Chair of the Select Committee, is now also making the case. So I say to the Secretary of State, if he will not listen to me and those on this side of the House, please listen to him and for the sake of our country, for people's lives, their well-being and their jobs, please listen and act wisely during these next four weeks. There is no shame in changing course and learning from other countries. Finally, on evidence and data, I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues have said repeatedly since the start of the pandemic that sharing the data, the evidence and the government's workings are essential to public trust and compliance when such draconian measures are being put in place. And so I wholeheartedly endorse uh, the comments by the former Prime Minister. I say to the government, publish the impact assessment, show us the scale of the trade-offs that are being made in terms of physical and mental health, jobs lost and damage to the economy. This is not an election campaign. This, both sides of the argument must be shared openly and the evidence shared transparently so that members here, and most importantly, the public, can look at the evidence and trust that we are collectively doing the right thing in the nation's interests. And in the few seconds left available to me, I would just also add my support to comments that have made, been made on both sides of the House about looking again at the regulations around collective acts of worship, publishing the evidence to show whether they are actually a source of infections and outbreaks, and on looking at the non-contact sports, particularly for adults, but also outdoor activities for children and young people. This is critical to people's mental health and their physical well-being. Mary Robinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. For months now, for weeks and months, businesses across Greater Manchester and our com communities have been subject to restrictions in order to reduce the rate of transmission of coronavirus and enable us to once more get to the position where we can live our lives normally. Towns and cities across the north have been particularly hard hit, and so we must deal with this virus and aim to be in a position at the end of the year where people can spend time with their loved ones again and business, businesses can have certainty for the future. The effects of the restrictions so far have been hugely difficult for businesses and caused immense strain. But many have been innovative, like mm. Ryan in Cheadle, who transformed his cafe into a greengrocer's to meet local demand. And they've also been willing to start up. This shows how, how businesses really want to get going, like Inventory in Cheadle Hume, a new bar already with rave reviews. And with government assistance, they have kept going, but they are truly worried about the effect that a further month-long lockdown will cause them. However, you will have heard, I know uh, the government has heard the urgings of businesses and people who work in the leisure and hospitality sector and the support that is needed to keep them open. And I welcome <coughs> the financial measures announced and applaud um, the measures that these businesses have taken to minimise transmission and operate in a, a secure, COVID secure way. However, this is the debate where we're called to balance our economy and our communities and the lives of our cons uh, constituents. And I believe it will be hard, therefore, for anyone to claim to be unequivocally right in their view or decision. Back in March, we spoke of the pressure on the NHS as the virus raged throughout the continent and reached a critical point here. The NHS remains at the forefront of my mind, as does the health, the lives of my constituents in Cheadle. 
My local hospital, Stepping Hill, is not yet receiving the numbers of COVID patients in comparison to the peak earlier this year, but it is close. At the height of the first wave, there are 130 coronavirus patients admitted. It's now just seven less than that at 123. This week, North West Ambulance Service declared a major incident. With ambulances still waiting, uh, ambulances waiting hours outside the hospital, sick people needing to be admitted. Madam Deputy Speaker, a four hour wait for an ambulance at a hospital door means that the ambulance crew and paramedics, paramedics caring for and treating those patients um, have to work hard. And whilst the ambulance is idle at the hospital, people have to wait for them to attend at home, sometimes having suffered heart attacks and stroke. So hospital pressure always has a knock-on effect, either through ambulance delays or cancelled operations. And for those whose elective surgery has been cancelled, it means many more months of pain and uncertainty with potentially deteriorating conditions. It's essential that we do not let the pressures increase as we enter this difficult winter season. Whatever the decisions we make, there are growing concerns about mental health. For people who have set up their businesses, put their life savings into them, workers who are concerned about their futures, people who are facing and fearful of loneliness, um, who are missing the socialising with their friends, who cannot go to church and receive the solace and the spirit uh, that they need there, I would ask for this to be considered. I would also ask that a post-COVID mental health strategy be put into place so that after all of this is through, in the new year when hopefully we are in a better position, people know that the charities such as mine, such as the Samaritans and local authorities have got the funding and the packages there to support them and we must do, do so too. Thank you. 12 with John, so Philip Davis. We were told, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the reason for the first national lockdown was to give time to build capacity in the NHS, presumably so we wouldn't need any further lockdowns. So what has the Secretary of State been doing? Why has he failed in this task? Well, we know what he's been doing. Instead of building that capacity and sorting out test and trace properly, he has been spending far too much of his time seemingly relishing the power of seeking to micromanage every aspect of everybody's lives. It's perfectly clear that lockdowns don't even work. They don't save lives, they merely spread them out over a longer period of time. But lockdowns do cost lives, as well as livelihoods, not to mention the other health implications of collapsing the economy, in particular the effect on people's mental health. If lockdowns and blizzards of arbitrary rules were the solution to this problem, we would have solved it months ago. We have not been short on version after version of senseless, arbitrary rules which have no scientific basis behind them at all. There has been a new set of rules virtually every single week, and yet the government still persists with this failed strategy. People are not stupid. They can see that the rules do not make any sense, and that is why they, like me, no longer have any faith in the people at the Department of Health and Public Health England who are making these decisions. I asked the Prime Minister earlier this week how many collapsed businesses and how many job losses he and his government believe are a price worth paying for pursuing this strategy. I don't think I got an answer. So perhaps the Secretary of State can answer that question today. How many job losses would it take before the Secretary of State accepted that we needed a different strategy? How many jobs is he prepared to sacrifice to keep on with this policy of lockdowns and arbitrary restrictions? Two million? Four million? Six million? People would like to know. How many house repossessions is he prepared to see to keep doing this same strategy? And that gets down to the nub of this, Madam Deputy Speaker. Those people, like the Secretary of State, like the pub like people at Public Health England, they're not offering to sacrifice their own jobs to pursue this strategy. Nobody voting for this motion tonight is offering, offering to sacrifice their own job in order to pursue this lockdown policy. Of course not. They're just expecting millions of others in our country to sacrifice their jobs to pursue this policy. Nobody voting for this motion tonight is offering to give up 20% of their salary 
or fo forego all of their income completely, as so many in our country are being expected to do. Oh goodness me no, Madam Deputy Speaker. Those sacrifices are just conveniently being expected of everyone else. Madam Deputy Speaker, it stinks. I would at least have some respect for those voting for this motion and for the Secretary of State if he offered to sacrifice his job in solidarity with all the others in the country he is expecting to do the same. But there's no chance of that. No wonder so many people have no faith in politicians. No wonder so many people feel there is one rule for us and one rule for them. I never thought, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would see the day a so-called Conservative Minister would stand up and urge Parliament to further sacrifice our most basic of freedoms, collapse the economy and destroy jobs, all to pursue a failed strategy. As a Conservative, Madam Deputy Speaker, whatever the problem, collapsing the economy and destroying people's jobs and livelihoods can never be the right solution. In Bern. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Government has repeatedly failed to listen to the voices of people on the front line in this pandemic and to our community's fears of the impact of COVID. The centralisation and handing of the response of this Government to the private sector has been catastrophic and will go down in history as such. My fear, once again, is can a Government ideologically hell-bent on using the pandemic as a testing bed for the promotion of the private private sector over public services listen and learn from its failings on the eve of another national lockdown. In Liverpool West Derby, the community and mutual aid groups have had to step in where the government and its friends and private companies like Serco have failed us all. In the first lockdown, the community in Liverpool came together to form mutual aid hubs because of these failings. We dis distributed 48,000 visors, 37,000 masks, thousands of aprons and scrubs to frontline workers, workers who have been left without PPE by the government. Fan support and food banks and North Liverpool food banks distributed thousands of food parcels to families and people in our community, often shielding, who have been left without adequate financial support by the government. In Liverpool, it was evident back in September that the pressure on hospitals was increasing due to the steep rise in COVID-19 cases. Liverpool's mayor, and following that, the leader of the opposition, called for a circuit breaker lockdown, which would have been timed alongside the school holidays. This would have relieved pressure on our health and social care services, and it would have saved lives, but tragically, it fell on deaf ears once again. The challenges facing our communities will be even greater over the winter, and will not be helped by this government, for example, refusing to provide free school meals over the holidays, or refusing to reinstate measures such as the eviction ban. Can the Secretary of State guarantee that he will now start to listen and the lessons have been learned from the failings of the first lockdown? Will he finally start prioritising our public services over the interests of private companies who have a track record of failure? And will he finally start listening to the people in communities who are being hardest hit by this pandemic? Sir Graham Brady. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. We are being asked uh, today uh, to take away the fundamental freedoms of nearly 68 million people in this country. And I would like, first of all, uh, to thank Mr Speaker for his strenuous efforts successfully in persu persuading the government that we should have three hours debate on this, not 90 minutes. Yeah. But can I just say that three hours debate on such a massive intervention taking away liberty shows how little we value the liberty of our constituents. It isn't good enough. It should have been at least a day of debate before we took such extreme action. Um, I, I have to give one. May I just put on the record that it's probably only thanks to him that we're having this debate at all in advance of the measures coming into force. My honourable friend is too kind, um, but I'm, I'm grateful to him. Um, I, I would say that I fully accept the sincerity of the Prime Minister, the sincerity of the Secretary of State in bringing forward the measures that they are and their belief uh, that they are doing the right thing. Nonetheless, I have to say that in over 23 years as a member of this House, when I vote against this motion tonight, I will do so with greater conviction 
than I have in casting any vote in those 23 years. Uh, other members have commented on the paucity of information and proper data uh, presented to the House, the fact that we have been asking for the proper impact assessment that gives both sides of the account. That's not only important for us in this House to be able to make a balanced judgment. Uh, crucially, it should be there. It should be the basis on which the government had made its judgment. So why it is not possible to publish that impact assessment, uh, I think, should be deeply troubling for all of us. I want to say a word, Madam Deputy Speaker, about a particular sector which is very important for my constituency, the aviation sector, which, after being decimated by the first lockdown and by an absurdly long period of quarantine without airport testing introduced to reduce that quarantine, uh, it has been decimated over a period of several months. Just as they were looking forward to the introduction in the next few weeks of an airport testing regime, instead, for the second time this year, the sector has been effectively closed uh, by the government. Businesses like supermarkets have enjoyed record profits, but also have enjoyed rates relief during this period. Airports and airlines have been reduced to zero revenue again and it is essential that they are given proper support or they simply won't be there when we come through this crisis and are looking uh, to them to resume uh, a, a very successful British industry over the years. But I want in my last two minutes, Madam Deputy Speaker, to raise a more fundamental question because I want to ask whether some of these measures that the government is taking, uh, whether the government actually has any right to take those measures. Because the thing that troubles me most is that the government is reaching too far into the private and family lives of our constituents. I think there is a, a, an unintended, perhaps, but an arrogance in assuming that government has the right to do so, that it has the right to tell people whether they can visit their elderly parents in a care home, whether it has the right to tell parents they can't see their children or their grandchildren, whether it has any right, for heaven's sake, to tell consenting adults with whom they are allowed to sleep. Does it have the right to ban acts of collective worship? And I'm, I'm glad that at this point, the churches are standing up against this and are objecting, because earlier in the year, I thought they possibly went a little too quietly. And any right, for heaven's sake, to ban golf or tennis without giving any reason whatsoever. When the Prime Minister was challenged on this on Monday, he simply said, well, if you start to give exemptions, the whole thing will unravel. We cannot, we cannot vote for measures on that flimsy basis. We cannot ask people to follow rules which patently make no sense and expect them to have respect uh, for what is uh, being done. So I have a fundamental uh, problem with much of what we're being asked to do here, as well as the economic impact, uh, the human toll which this will have. And I, I can't be the only member, I'll close with this thought, I can't be the only member of this House who has sat in a constituency surgery with a constituent in tears, as they have said, that they can't see a vulnerable elderly parent with dementia in a care home. We mustn't do it. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Given the near crisis point in the capacity and the ability of the NHS to cope with rising cases and hospital admissions across the country, I believe that action is necessary. I am, however, at a loss as to why the government has acted so late. This has led to more cases and ultimately more deaths and means that we now need a longer lockdown which will have a huge human and economic cost. For weeks we have seen the evidence pointing to a growing second wave of the virus, not just in areas like Bradford which has been subject to restrictions for months but right across the country. I know these are difficult decisions for the government to make but weeks ago the leader of the opposition called for a circuit breaker lockdown in line with Sage advice, which the government then choose, chose not to just ignore, but to also ridicule. Had it been enacted then, this short lockdown, coinciding with half term, could have put a break on the virus at a critical moment. Some of the pain and hardship that we are now facing 
would have been spared. Now we are facing a potentially open-ended lockdown, with ministers unable to confirm when this will end. Businesses will be shut for longer, families will be separated, mental and physical health will suffer. The economic cost and the social cost of lockdown has been made worse by the government's failure to act earlier. In West Yorkshire, things have been even more chaotic. The government announced last Thursday that our region would go into Tier 3 from the following Monday. At that point, ministers repeatedly denied that the country was facing a national lockdown. Businesses and families across the region began to prepare for the new restrictions. Yet the very next day, the very next day, the national lockdown was leaked to the press and it was announced that West Yorkshire would stay in Tier 2 until the lockdown. Over recent weeks, the government has treated the people of the North with utter contempt, and this is just the latest example of a long and sorry saga. The government must commit to honouring the financial commitment they made to the people and businesses of West Yorkshire when the Tier 3 agreement was made. Now turning to a couple of very specific points. The government needs to plan and deal with social isolation and loneliness, in particular amongst older people and those with caring responsibilities. So many of my constituents across many faiths have asked me to tell the government and the Prime Minister that collective acts of worship are essential and should not be made illegal by any government. They are an essential part of their faith and an essential part of their lives and I asked the government to reconsider the ban on collective worship. And the government should also look at how gyms and other sports facilities can be reopened safely. Again, this is essential for maintaining mental and physical health through these long and difficult winter months. Finally, Mr Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government needs a plan for getting out of this lockdown and dealing with the economic consequences. The lack of an impact assessment for these regulations and the subsequent cost to jobs and businesses is simply neglectful, because areas like Bradford will suffer the most. If at the end of the lockdown we return to a new set of local restrictions where many businesses will just simply not survive, there needs to be an absolute focus in government on saving and creating jobs, because without this the consequences for my constituents will be devastating. So I say to the government, do not waste this time, use it to get a grip on the virus and begin planning for our economic recovery. A failure to do so will lead to a prolonging of the lockdown and all the human, social and economic harm that that brings. Thank you. Sir Charles Walker. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is lovely to see you in the chair. Madam Deputy Speaker, our freedoms are like the air we breathe. They're fundamental to us as a nation and to who we are as its people. Yet once again, we stand on the threshold of using the rule of law to undermine the rule of law, the foundations of which have been laid over centuries. And can I say this, Madam Deputy Speaker? We are not asking our constituents to do anything we have never asked. We have coerced them. We have coerced them through criminal and civil law. Let us not use that word ask because it is not an accurate description of what we have done. We have criminalised freedom of association, the freedom to go about one's business, the freedom to travel and the freedom to protest, the freedom to protest. That is the oxygen of democracy. And Madam Deputy Speaker, this hurts my head <clears throat> and it hurts my heart. And dismissing these sincerely held concerns as wanting to let the virus rip is both deeply ungenerous and deeply, deeply unkind. But in responding to that charge, Madam Deputy Speaker, I say if this Parliament is not the place for disputation, delectable or otherwise, where is this rigour to be found? And I want people to live long lives, full lives, happy lives, myself included. But my mortality, our mortality, is ultimately our contract with our maker, whereas our fundamental rights are our contract with 
government. So I will not be supporting this legislation. I think it is terribly unjust and, like my dear friend, in many parts, cruel. I will have no part of criminalising parents for seeing their children and children for seeing their parents. No part. This legislation goes against my every instinct, perhaps an instinct even more fundamental than the love and touch of my family. And I am not living in fear of the virus. I will not live in fear of the virus, but I am living in fear of something much darker, much darker hiding in the shadows. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, when the sunlight returns, if it will return, I hope it chases those shadows away. But I can't be sure that it will. I cannot be sure. And that is at the heart of my anxiety and the anxiety of so many of the people I represent in this place. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Matt Rodden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to be able to contribute this afternoon. Madam Deputy Speaker, we now undoubtedly face a very difficult and indeed challenging situation, and I support the government's approach. Cases of the virus are doubling every few days, and the sheer pace of growth now it's quite clearly will outstrip the capacity of the NHS to respond. We cannot ignore the very serious position we now face. These measures, however difficult, are necessary, and indeed other options such as the tiered system have quite clearly now failed. <coughs> however, although these measures are difficult, they are necessary, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I would seek to um, first pay tribute to all of those who are contributing so bravely in the NHS and other services, our care workers, our NHS workers, key workers, volunteers and indeed other members of the community. This bravery and determination is impressive and it's being demonstrated by people who've been through this once already this year and indeed in some cases during the summer and the early autumn as well. I would like to however raise a series of very specific points which I, I hope the Minister will uh, be able to respond to later. Um, first and foremost, it would have been so much better if the government had acted sooner. The numbers were quite clear, and as my right honourable friend mentioned earlier um, from the dispatch box, if this action had been taken sooner, lives would have been saved, and indeed the economy protected. Um, and it is worth reflecting on that, and I do hope ministers will reflect quite deeply on this issue and on the, um, the delay, which has been so unfortunate. There are a series of specific points I would like to raise, though. First and foremost, I would, I would hope that the Secretary of State for Health will look into this matter. We must fix the test and trace system. Um, it, it's quite apparent that it is currently failing. There's a low rate of, of test and trace carrying on compared with the need. Um, in my own area, we've seen um, some very serious problems, delays to facilities coming to Reading and Woodley. We've also seen a, a very unfortunate incident in a care home, and I would ask him to look again at the great, the, whether it's possible to have much greater capacity for testing in care homes, where people are so clearly vulnerable at this time, particularly vulnerable at this time, and indeed also to look at the scope for testing, far greater testing across the health and care system, perhaps looking in much, much greater detail at the scope for testing home visiting staff. I've had constituents raise that with me in some great concern, actually, elderly, vulnerable residents who would be reassured if there was more capacity for testing uh, visitors coming to their homes. There are, however, a number of other measures which I hope he, the government as a whole will look into. These are mainly economic and social measures, and other members have raised these today. Um, I would particularly like to mention the concerns of many self-employed people. I realise that people across, members across the House uh, share this issue. One uh, person said to me, only today, in fact, I have paid in all my life into the, by tax and through the national insurance system, and now at a time of great need, I'm not able to get anything back. I do hope that the government can look at the loopholes in the measures that they've currently taken and reconsider them and understand that there are people who are potentially missing out on support at this difficult time. I do appreciate that they are reviewing some of this. I would also urge them to look across sectors in the economy, not just the most visible end of those sectors. So for example, in the hospitality sector, measures have been taken to support pubs. It's right that they should be supported. 
Across the supply chain, though, and other dependent businesses, there has been much less support. And it's very important that ministers remember this and take further action to look at the whole supply chains and whole sectors and understand that a wide range of businesses are under pressure at this difficult time. Finally, I would just like to very briefly mention that I agree wholeheartedly with my right honourable friends and other concerns that have been raised across the House about the importance of people being able to worship. And I do hope this will be reviewed and indeed that, that sport and the contribution it plays to our society, the, support, the, the value it has for children and for people's mental health is reconsidered. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Jane Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Prior to this debate, I've been contacted by many constituents with their opinions on how to vote today. My default position would be to support those who wish for fewer restrictions, to allow others to live their lives as they choose to do, to help and support each and every constituent in that choice. However, this is an unprecedented situation and the first duty of any government must be to protect its citizens. I know that the government, and especially the Prime Minister, has not taken any of the, these dis difficult decisions lightly. I have supported and will continue to support the tiered structure and the ability to be able to look at a very local level and understand what is going on in each locality. It has enabled some of the country to remain with a very low level of restriction for an extended period. However, in order to prevent a deluge of intensive care beds needed, I come to the conclusion that we must have a heightened restriction to our liberty throughout November to stem the tide of this virus. This is not to say that our constituents have not followed the rules. I would like to thank the people of Loughborough constituency, residents, visitors, students and pupils alike, who have very clearly followed the rules, which has not only helped themselves, but also their friends and neighbours. This is a hard task ahead for many during November. There are a number of religious festivals and commemorations, which in other years have attracted huge crowds and gatherings, such as Diwali, Advent, the birthday of Guru Nanak. These are often times when families get together to celebrate their faith. This will not be possible in private homes this year, but I would still press that churches and places of worship should be allowed to open for those specific events to support their communities. Loughborough usually has a large and very moving remembrance service in Queen's Park, along with others in Shepshed and surrounding villages. Again, these will not be able to happen in the same way this year, but this does not diminish our need to honour our fallen. We will remember them. My friends and colleagues and those who live in Loughborough constituency will know that I have been going on, as they would put it, about a V-shaped recovery for a long time. We owe it to those who have lost their lives to ensure that we come back stronger and better as a country and as a constituency. We have capitalised on all the support from the government in Loughborough, the grants and support for small businesses, the loans that have been available to keep businesses going, the individual support for those who have found themselves in a difficult situation, and programmes such as Eat Out to Help Out, Kickstart in particular, and the early town deal funding have all supported the local community. I welcome that this support package has been extended to ensure that there remains a safety net for those who need it. So, let's get ready for the time these new restrictions will ease. Let us take this time to plan, each individual, each family, each business, each organisation. Let every one of us make a positive decision to create a good recovery for ourselves, our local communities and our businesses. Risk ass assessment is the key to this. With risk, you eradicate if you can and you mitigate where you can't. This is a global pandemic. We cannot eradicate, so we must mitigate. As part of the planning process, we should therefore be looking at taking a different approach to events and venues to produce their own risk assessments on how many people they can safely accommodate whilst adhering to social distancing guidelines. Let's spend this month making sure each of us has a plan to get on in life. Let's turn the negative into a positive and all take part in the recovery of this great country. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Like many honourable members, I'd like to start by paying tribute to all of the British public, including those in my Aberavon constituency, who've shown such resilience and fortitude throughout an extremely difficult 2020. Madam Deputy Speaker, these new restrictions are, of course, for the people of England, but the economic package accompanying them will, of course, have a significant effect on Wales and on my Aberavon constituents. Regrettably, it's become all too evident 
that the Prime Minister and Chancellor only took decisive action in terms of economic support once London and parts of the South East were put into Tier 2 and then full lockdown. When we in Wales went into our firebreaker, the, government, the UK Government refused to extend furlough. When the North of England went into Tier 3, the Government refused to extend furlough. Now, with new restrictions affecting the South East, the money suddenly appears, mm -hmm. as if by magic. Mm -hmm. Madam Deputy Speaker, furlough must be fair for all. It's as simple as that. During his successful general election campaign, the Prime Minister promised to level up the UK. In reality, the very opposite has happened. This virus has turned the gap between the South East and the rest of the UK into a chasm. We now need a clear and specific plan that states what levelling up is actually supposed to mean in practice. And this plan must have our steel industry at its heart. A focus on steel would deliver three interlinked benefits. First, it would support the creation of high-skill, well-paid jobs in areas of the UK that have been ignored by successive Conservative governments since 2010, including in South Wales. Second, it would strengthen the UK's sovereign capability. One of the most important lessons of the pandemic is that we are far too dependent on supply chains from other countries, and increasingly those countries are run by authoritarian governments who are not our natural allies. And third, it would enable our transition to net zero, backing the industries of the future, but also greening current industries. Yet by failing to provide the UK's largest steelmaker and the employer of 4,000 steel workers in my constituency with the emergency loans during the pandemic to plug the cash flow gap caused by the fall in demand, the government has once again chosen to sit on its hands. Madam Deputy Speaker, there can be no post-pandemic recovery, no levelling up and no modern manufacturing renaissance without a strong and healthy steel industry. If I could just end by saying a few words on test, track and trace. While Welsh Labour backed local experts and our local authorities, this UK Government has put test, track and trace in the hands of Serco without any proper tendering process. Serco won huge contracts to the tune of £500 million and, through no fault of the vast majority of their employees, I might add, utterly failed our country at this time of need. The, the choice that this government has taken is to privatise and centralise, when what it should have been doing is keeping what is a truly public function in the public sector and allowing local authorities to mobilise the expertise that they have on the ground. So I hope that this UK government will look to Cardiff Bay, will look to the Welsh government, will learn the lessons of test and trace and take this four-week lockdown as an opportunity to fix the system and to learn from the way in which the Welsh Government has done it. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Order. I'll be moving straight to the um, uh, Right Honourable Member for the Forest of Dean, um, but after uh, Mr Harper has spoken, I will reduce the time limit to three minutes in order to try to accommodate as many colleagues as possible. Mark Harper. Uh, I'm grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, and you, you will have indicated from uh, my intervention on the Prime Minister earlier that um, for only the second time in my 15 years in Parliament, I'm not able to support my uh, front bench. And you will know from our uh, shared endeavours through our experience in usual channels that it's not easy for a former Chief Whip to not support their party, but I do so for the following reasons. Um, uh, I very strongly supported the tiered approach. Uh, and my part of the world, which I'm here to represent, uh, has a very low level of virus. And uh, my constituents have been working incredibly hard, uh, businesses and individuals, to keep the virus under control. And there's a very low level of prevalence, not just across the community, but actually, and particularly amongst those who are over 60, where the level of vir virus remains low, and over the last few weeks has been flat or falling. Um, and certainly in conversation with my uh, Director of Public Health and my local NHS, um, no concerns have been raised uh, about the NHS being overwhelmed. That was my starting position. I listened very carefully to what the Prime Minister set out in his press conference on Saturday. Uh, and I looked yesterday at the data that was published. 
Um, but there are several flaws with that data, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. First of all, the modelling that's taken place about the number of deaths um, is, is uh, old data, and we already know, and my, my right honourable friend, the, uh, member for, the right honourable member for, the, uh, for Maidenhead, set this out very clearly, we already know that the, the most um, extreme of those models is wrong. It, it's predicted uh, things for dates that have already passed, and it's been wrong by a factor of four or five. Um, the second thing we know is that the modelling that SAGE has undertaken doesn't take into account, and it's set out very clearly in documents published yesterday, does not take into account the introduction of the tiered system over the last couple of weeks. So therefore, all the modelling um, just doesn't take into account the fact that over half of the country has been placed under Tier 2 or Tier 3 restrictions. And we know from the information published just yesterday by Steve Rotherham, the uh, Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, that that region, which was the first region placed in Tier 3 restrictions, has seen quite a significant reduction in virus um, across all of the region, all of the parts of that region. Um, and, of course, it's that data from SAGE that's been fed into the National Health Service and all of the modelling done by the NHS about its capacity has been based on that SAGE modelling. So if that modelling is wrong, as I believe it is, then the NHS um, forecasts are wrong. And it was very interesting, one of the leaked slides last week which showed the capacity of the NHS being exhausted in the next few weeks, interestingly, was not used in the presentation by the Prime Minister at the press conference and no data has been published to substantiate it. And that's because if you look at it, according to that slide, the South West Hospital capacity should have been exceeded already. And it has not. And it is nowhere near being exceeded. And I simply therefore don't believe the government has made the case. Um, the one further reason um, for, for myself is that these uh, regulations also give the power to use reasonable force to enforce them to officers of the state who are not trained to safely use that power. The Secretary of State knows I've raised this on the floor of the House and with him and with his ministers, and I had understood there was a review to be taken place to remove it. That power should only be used by police officers who are properly trained to safely use it. Uh, and that, though for those reasons, I'm unable to support the government and will be voting against the regulations later today. Yeah, yeah. Tim Farron. Uh, Deputy Speaker, my communities in South Cumbria, in the Lakes and the Dales, arguably uh, the worst hit on both counts in terms of our vulnerability economically, with 40% of our entire workforce on furlough at one stage, a six-fold increase in unemployment, and then on the other hand, with an age profile 10 years above the national average, the vulnerability uh, and the potential for fatality in the face of the virus is great. At the same time, we're seeing huge pressure on our local health service, which has done a stunning job over the last seven, eight months, making personal sacrifices in every single department. We see the beginning of signs of being overwhelmed by the virus at this period. Just in the last few days, the Northwest Ambulance Service uh, urging no one to call 999 unless their call was for a life threatening emergency. So this is what the government is seeking to prevent and the greatest threat to our liberty is a threat to our right to life and our access to medical services which are threatening, threatened to be overwhelmed if action isn't taken. Having said that, I am deeply critical of some of the government's approach on this issue, not least on some of the economic uh, areas where there has been a, 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 a blind spot when it comes to three million people, we believe, who have been excluded from any kind of support whatsoever. I think of people who have been self-employed for 18 months or so in my constituency. I think of people running small limited companies, taxi drivers, personal trainers, hairdressers, getting absolutely nothing for seven or eight months, or people who just happened to be on the payroll just a day or two too late earlier this spring. Those people who are the backbone of our economy, the entrepreneurs that we need to drive the recovery when eventually it comes, those people left in deep and desperate debt, not sure if they can afford to put food on the table for their children or pay to keep a roof over their heads. The government must act and must act now to help those who have been excluded. I also point out that a third of those who are excluded are private renters. Now, the government immediately and rightly extended mortgage holidays for those who are lucky enough to own their own homes. Not a thing for renters in the last few days or weeks. And that is why this is a moment, surely, for the government to rush through some of the 
other legislation, and that is to suspend Section 8 rent arrears and Section 21 no-fault evictions and to up the local housing allowance so people can afford to pay their rent. It is it's essential that we protect the lives and well-beings of all of our constituents and protect them from hardship. And it is above all important that we protect them from the potential of homelessness and indeed destitution. A final word is this, that on the, uh, on the, the news about the furlough, we're told that people who were laid off prior to the 23rd of September will not be furloughed. I can tell you there are thousands of people in the tourism industry that were, were laid off because of the hardship that industry is facing. I ask for a package for hospitality and tourism that backdates that further back than the 23rd of September this year and provides a package of support right the way through to March and to the Easter holidays next year. Salute. 34 years ago, as an otherwise fit and healthy 24-year-old, I was carried out of my home by an ambulance crew with a collapsed lung. I had an emergency operation in the middle of, middle of the night. I was frightened. I was worried. I was concerned about many things. Would I live? What would be the impact on my health for the rest of my life? But the one thing I wasn't worried about was that there would be a hospital bed for me. Yesterday, in England, 10,971 COVID patients were in our hospitals. That is an increase of 2,376 on the last week. That's an increase of over a fifth. My own hospital, the Luton and Dunstable, tells me that they have much less spare capacity at the moment than they did in uh, April and May during the first lockdown. So the margin for error is very, very small. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are no good choices before any of us. We are being asked to do a horrendous thing today, the impact on jobs, the impact on businesses, the loss of our freedoms, which every one of us who will support the government tonight cherishes just as much as those who uh, will not, uh, are awful things for us to have to do. But against that, we must set lives lost, hospitals turning people away, the lack of treatment for people who are ill or who have had terrible accidents. And I cannot, in all conscience, vote for anything or not support a measure that would allow that situation to happen. I wish this motion was amendable. I think there are things we could do on safe care home visits. As the Second Church of States Commissioner, of course, I am concerned about the lack of collective worship, and I would say ch churches have been some of the safest places I have been in recent weeks. I'm concerned about businesses with bills they can't pay. I'm concerned about the events industry, which just somehow seems to have fallen outside so many of the support packages. Whipsnade Zoo, in my constituency, is a full 600 acres. It can't open, but Q can. Why not just close the indoor elements of zoos and allow the outdoor to go, um, you know, for, to welcome people? Let's make sure we have click and collect for small shops, small independent shops, people doing their Christmas shopping, so they don't lose out, so people can shop safely come the 3rd of December and not have big queues. And let's make sure we don't have huge New Year's Eve crowd celebrations. The most important thing I want to say, though, is enforcement. It's not explaining and educating. The police, councils, shops themselves must do more about people not wearing masks in shops. People should wear masks at work, and it's terrible that only eight out of ten people are self-isolating properly. This is a shared responsibility for all of us. Craig McKinley. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, mean, I can fully understand uh, the lure of the precautionary principle that the government has been faced with, with, with dreadful scenarios and increasing cases and projections. I can understand that lure of let's do this just in case, let's take no chances, and I certainly do not envy the Prime Minister or any of the Quad Group uh, for their decision. But I have a number of concerns that simply cannot be overcome. Let us cast our mind forward to the 2nd of December, because I feel we're going to be here again. What will good enough look like that we can unwind. It took three and a half months last time for us to have a haircut or have our first pint in a pub. What will be the level of daily infections or hospitalisations that are deemed good enough to unwind? Now, I think this is a mistake by the government for not 
considering what those figures might be, because it would at least give the public something to aim for and something to look forward to. We've got no concept, no data as to what that is likely to be. We're told that this is the last bridge before the cavalry come over the hill, that we have better treatments than we have that vaccine that we're all looking for. But we don't know when that vaccine is going to be ready. We don't know how effective it's going to be. We don't know the time frame over which it can be rolled out across the population. And let us not forget, Madam Deputy Speaker, HIV has been with us for 40 years and we still do not have a vaccine. We have so many clear uh, nonsenses within the regulations. I and many others in this House, I'm sure, are getting emails from gym owners and users. I've had them from people who enjoy outdoor archery. Uh, and obviously the golf situation and a lot from churchgoers. How can it be sensible for a couple to go for a walk on the golf club that they belong to, but they face a fine if they dare do it with a golf club and a ball? And of course, please. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. Has he received, as I have, a letter signed by 1,500 church uh, organisation um, managers and ministers and people of religion opposing these regulations and asking why on earth is the government closing churches in the way that they're doing? It makes an, I think it has to be an overwhelming number of the responses I've had are from churchgoers and I'll just develop that point very briefly. You know, congregations that go to churches, to synagogues, to mosques, to temples, these are adherent, sensible, disciplined people. To treat them as anything but, I'm afraid, is nothing but an insult. Now, just a few weeks ago, we were offered the tiered system, and that was supported by this House. It was deemed to be the new holy grail that we can look to. And Liverpool, under tier three, seems to be having results. We simply have not given enough time for those opportunities to bed in. But in Kent, in South Fanning, in my constituency, we're currently under tier one. What will all this mean to those businesses who've invested heavily in COVID-friendly and, and secure uh, facilities, the businesses and the pubs. We've already seen flip-flopping under the early published uh, proposals that off-sales and microbreweries can now continue selling uh, beer uh, outside. Whereas always, the supermarkets could have sold as much as they like. This, I'm afraid, is at the heart of muddled thinking. I want to develop just very briefly what I want to call the Wilkinson's conundrum a great store on every high street. How can it be that they can continue to sell essential and non-essential, and yet the independent shop next door that sells just some of that non-essential stuff that Wilkinson can continue to sell will be illegal for them to continue? I'm being asked to spend £50 billion extra today, or perhaps even more. There is no data as to what this means on other health issues, there is no assessment of what this means to families not able to see grandchildren or to see off loved ones in their final days. I'm here to make a decision. I will not be abstaining. I'm paid to have a view. And tonight I will be voting against this. I'm sorry. Order, I would just like to gently point out that not everybody is going to get in on this debate. At this stage, if interventions are taken, particularly from people who have not, are not on the speaking list, it will prevent others from speaking. Sir Edward Lee. Uh, if we're going to defeat this virus, the public have to have confidence in the government. They have to know that everything the government does is based not on opinion polls, but on evidence. Modelling is not evidence. Scientific fact is evidence. And there's been too many chopping and changing of government policy, encouraging us to eat out, to help out, to get back the offices in September, then get, stay away from offices. So base everything on evidence. And I've got so little time, I want to mention one point where evidence is all important. The leaders of all the faith communities have written to the Prime Minister, demanding evidence of how it is that people attending church services are spreading COVID. There is no evidence. I know there's no evidence. The chief scientific uh, advisor of the government has confirmed there is no evidence. Everybody knows if they go to their local church or indeed to their mosque that mask wearing um, is enforced, social distancing is enforced. Even in mosques, my friends tell me people are bringing in their own prayer mats. There is no evidence for this ban. 
what the ban comes because the government says if we're going to stop people going to pubs, then we have to stop people going to churches or mosques or synagogues. There is no evidence. However, I intervened on the Prime Minister on, uh, on a couple of days ago. He assured me that this was only a temporary ban on religious services. The Prime Minister took the trouble to come up to me uh, before this debate and said, Edward, we're going to get churches open. I said, when? He said, soon. I understand contacts are taking place with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of Westminster to try and get the churches open as soon as possible. On that basis, and on that basis only, that this is a temporary measure and that the government will provide evidence and the churches will open on the 2nd of December, on that basis I am prepared to vote for this measure tonight. On that basis and on that promise, because it is a fundamental human right in any society. It is, we are signatories to the Convention of Human Rights. It is a fundamental human right for people to be able to go to communal worship. And for religious people, you can't just tell them that, okay, sometime in the future, you'll be able to uh, go to religious service. That's not good enough for them. They want to be able to have that communal worship and to have it now. So the government, and I'm looking at the health secretary, it's not good enough just to say that we're all in this together because we're stopping people playing golf or we're stopping people going to bars, that yes, religious people have to be under the same uh, restrictions. Provide the evidence and I've received this assurance that these churches, these synagogues, these mosques are going to open before the 2nd of December or at least by the 2nd of December. And on that basis, and on that basis only, I will vote for the government. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And this is, of course, the eventuality that we all had hoped to evolve. And I personally hate even contemplating uh, curtailment of freedoms in the way that our right honourable friend for Altrincham and Sale West set out. But no responsible government could sidestep what it is faced with. We, we use this word a lot now in the last few days, the overwhelming of the National Health Service. It is worth just stopping to dwell and think about what that actually means in practice, as our friend from South West Bedfordshire uh, outlined. It means people who need other essential treatments just not being able to get them in the way that we have come to expect we will always be able to rely uh, on the National uh, Health Service. And of course, this time, uh, unlike the previous uh, lockdown, we are approaching winter with all the stresses and strains on the National Health Service that brings in any case. This is a global pandemic, but quite often we speak about it as if we were the only country involved. In fact, every one of the five major countries of Western Europe had a steep rise uh, in COVID cases during the course of October, and now there are new restrictions coming across the continent. Perhaps most notably in France and Germany, the other two large economies of Europe, with very different political traditions, different health systems, different experiences with test and trace. Both of those, like us, sought to exhaust the possibilities of a, a localised and a regional approach and now are returning once again to a national uh, program. It is true that in different parts of our country there are different rates of prevalence of this virus. But, this, but the trend is upwards pretty much everywhere with the rate above one. Uh, and as the Prime Minister outlined earlier, of course, you know, when one hospital gets full, they move patients on to another hospital. Staff have to move on uh, in order to, to, to shore up the system. Ultimately, we are one nation and we have one national health service. Now, this lockdown is not going to be the same uh, as, the, as the previous one in particular uh, because education will remain fully open. And I really want to uh, thank the government uh, and welcome that, uh, welcome that approach. And I acknowledge that to prioritise schooling, that does involve some trade-offs. Uh, and, and therefore, you do have to, you have to acknowledge that any time that, that people get together, there is a risk of transmission of this virus. But I would ask for special reconsideration in two areas. One is about non-contact outdoor sports, and the second is so many uh, colleagues, uh, others have mentioned, is about religious services. So obviously not everyone has faith, but for some that do, the solace that they receive from attending church or another place of worship with other people is as important for their mental health as other mental health services, which we rightly prioritise and will keep going come what may. I welcome the business support and I hope government will also use this time to make sure there are medium term uh, support packages for the most affected sectors. Nobody wants to be doing this, but I will be backing these measures this evening.
I think Dan Oakley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In Huntingdonshire, as of last Friday, we had a very low and stable figure of 58 cases per 100,000, and about half a dozen hospital beds in Hinchinbrook Hospital were occupied by COVID patients. In effect, without lockdown, we would have remained at Tier 1 status. This is of great credit to the caution and sensible behaviour shown by residents locally, and also reflects the excellent local public services and council provision that I am seeing. If I was to support these further massive restrictions on our liberty and democracy, I would need not only more evidence for their chances of success than I have received to date, but also an understanding as to why Cambridgeshire should be treated in exactly the same way as high-risk areas in the country. One well-respected local family business of some 40 years standing has just contacted me to say that they will not be able to stand a further lockdown. The majority of local businesses I speak to have already made redundancies and now dread for their futures. Huntingdonshire has one of the highest proportions of small business ownership in the country, typically without the capital reserves of large corporations. These businesses have done everything they can to stay afloat through finding new markets, through taking up government loans and furlough schemes, and general twisting and turning to do anything and everything to keep their businesses alive. And I have been incredibly impressed by the resilience and resourcefulness of these local businesses, and they frankly deserve more than for me to tell them that I have voted for a further lockdown given our low local COVID rate and the national lack of evidence. Our local health workers, carers, volunteers have also done a magnificent job, and many lessons have now been learnt that should improve health and care provision with the second wave of the virus. Yes, of course, we need to save the NHS, but this cannot be at the cost of wiping out the economy, without which there will be no money to pay for the NHS. The problem is that we're not getting a weighted assessment of the health costs in the context of all the other costs. When the Allied Forces plan D-Day, an assessment of the human and material costs were drawn up before deciding to invade. It would be wrong to say that Churchill and the generals failed to show humanity in their assessment of likely casualties, but they weighed this up against the strategic objective of retaining a democratic European continent. And we now roll from one lockdown to another with no vaccine and no effective track and trace system. We need urgently to consider our weighted strategy our objectives here, accepting that whatever happens, lockdown or no lockdown, we are ultimately going to have to learn to live with this virus. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are three questions here. How did we get into this situation? What do we do about it now? And how do we find our way out of it? And much has been said about whether we should have done this or other things earlier. And when uh, the crisis has passed, then there should be a full and detailed examination of decision-making in response to this pandemic. When the time comes for that, I will fully support it, but that time is not now, and we have more immediate questions to answer. And this House has to take decisions today on the basis of where we are, not on where we wish we were. And we have to make those decisions, as so often, on the basis of imperfect information and in the knowledge that all our options will harm someone. And I respect the fact that different members of this House can, for good and decent reasons, come to different conclusions on that. And I don't dispute for a moment the human and financial cost of these measures. But it seems to me that the preponderance of the scientific evidence that we have seen is telling us that if we do not take a decision with damaging consequences, we face an outcome with devastating consequences. And for that reason, I will support these measures today. At times of threat, we act to protect the most vulnerable members of our society, even when it hurts the rest of us. That is who we are as a nation, and whatever else this pandemic changes, it must not change that. But the government's job is not just to react, but also to plan for the future. And on this, I have to say, I do not think the government has said enough. We must now accept the need to live with this virus in the longer term. And it's simply impossible for businesses or individuals to manage their lives if we are to find ourselves continually and unpredictably in and out of lockdown. So these measures may be a short-term strategy, but they cannot be a long-term one. And in a second lockdown, everyone knows it can happen more than once. What's tolerable as a one-off 
looks less so when it seems like a repeated occurrence. As others have said, lockdown is hard on our mental health, harder still when it's dark and wet outside, and all this, I'm afraid, affects likely compliance with these restrictions. And if people don't comply, the health benefits of a lockdown disappear altogether. So there has to be clarity on how we come out of these restrictions, not just, I'm afraid, on what date the government hopes that we do. So the government must say clearly what objectively we need to see in order to have these restrictions lifted so everyone can see the way out of them as well as the way in, and thereby, I hope, making it more likely that people will comply with them and more likely that they will have their desired effect. Edward Timpson. Sure, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, as the Prime Minister said earlier, none of us uh, want this, uh, pitting lives against livelihoods, and I would also add the quality of our lives. It's, it's excruciating, it's uncomfortable, and it tugs at our values and sensibilities. But the truth is that it is an invidious conundrum with no good options, as my uh, honourable uh, friend has just said. And we can't escape the fact that these measures that we're voting for this evening will come at a significant cost for many people in our constituencies, including mine of Edisbury, whether that's social, financial or from a mental health perspective. And I take a particular interest in the impact it has on children um, who we know through the first lockdown uh, have had a whole range of new experiences, not all of them good, uh, that may play out for many years to come. So I also uh, welcome the fact that schools will remain open during the next four weeks. I think that is incredibly important for a whole range of reasons, uh, and I would urge uh, every parent to do their bit in making sure that their child gets the education and all the other benefits uh, from uh, the schools remaining open. Uh, I would ask my right hon. Friend, uh, the Minister, just to clarify that if a child is classified as clinically vulnerable, whether they're still expected to go to school, as I've had some, some queries about that. Uh, but we also know that there is the financial uh, damage that this will cause, the scarring of the economy, as it's sometimes uh, known. Uh, and I have highlighted, as my right hon. Friend will know, and will again in the debate on Monday in Westminster Hall, the wedding industry, as well as pubs, zoos, beauty salons, and so on, as we did in the first lockdown. We can't forget that despite the significant uh, package from the, the Chancellor, uh, to support them, that there are still gaps that, that need to be filled and they need some hope for the future. But uh, I do understand that the, the figures, uh, as we can read them, um, and I would like to see more granular data in the future, um, are not good to read. Uh, whether that's the number of COVID patients now in hospital and the trajectory that many uh, of our trusts, our hospital trusts, are telling us that they are on. And so we do need to act, uh, and I will be supporting the measures this evening to do that. Uh, but uh, I, I would urge my right honourable friend, as has been mentioned by uh, other uh, members, that we do need to, as part of this, make sure we don't end up in a vicious cycle of lockdowns, which will do more and more damage um, as we uh, still try and control the virus. So we do need a plan for how we can live with it in the longer term. Uh, what we do next to uh, once we've reduced uh, the R number below one to keep it there so that we can continue to reopen the economy, but most of all to give Edisby res residents and businesses uh, the, the normality, the certainty and the hope that they crave. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. When we entered lockdown in March, none of us could be sure how long the measures would be necessary then or indeed what would be necessary in the future. But we accepted the privations and the limitations on our life to defeat the virus. But we very quickly realised we wouldn't return to normal. We grieve the loss of life and we grieve the loss of livelihoods as well. So it is with a heavy heart that a lot of us have got to contemplate what we're contemplating in this House today. But it is clear, isn't it, that uh, if we look at what many of our constituents are telling us to do, I've only had two constituents write to me and say I should support the Government tonight, and I have a responsibility to those constituents. But we as Members of Parliament have a greater responsibility as well. We have a responsibility to our constituents, and we have a responsibility to our country. And whatever we think about we should have persevered with the tier system, or whether we think the restrictions have been too onerous on any sorts of uh, activities, and I want to touch on a couple in a moment, 
No responsible government and no responsible Secretary of State could sit and not listen to the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence. Uh, and I regret that that is where it is, but it must be right that we cannot allow the National Health Service the right, as several members of people have said, to enjoy the uh, health, uh, that right to health that we mustn't threaten if we can avoid doing so. And therefore, with uh, some reluctance, as my right honourable friend knows, I'm going to support the government tonight. Reluctance because I say to him, there is, if we, we do these measures by consent, and if you look at some of what the government has set out tonight, there are huge contradictions in some of the guidance and some of the regulations. And still the government hasn't the chance to clarify those, and it should do so. The, the most obvious, of course, is about the off-sale of beers, where the regulations clearly say you can do so, um, but the guidance this morning still hasn't been changed. That's maybe not the most important one. Some of the guidance on educational establishments and what they're able to do is much worse and hasn't been clarified. But can I say to him, the inconsistencies as well. Why can I go for a run where someone could cough and splutter, but I couldn't play a round of golf? Like so many of, uh, like so many of my fellow members of this House, uh, I regret that we are putting privations and restrictions on a huge numbers of people who wish to worship uh, and express their faith. And I say to my Royal Honourable Friend, I hope that the, the uh, observation and the commitment that was given to my other Right Honourable Friend will be honoured. So I will be supporting the Government tonight, but I hope that the Government will use the time to make sure it sets out clearly what its targets and objectives are, and sets out clearly that it can stand up the test, track and trace system, and it can set up the new, more widespread testing. Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and when looking at this issue and my vote this evening, I look at the evidence uh, and I ask myself three questions. Can our local NHS cope? Have we assessed properly the impact of the regional lockdown? And which path will be the least destructive to the health and well-being of the constituents that sent me here to serve them? And when it comes to the local NHS, the figures today show that we have 24 COVID inpatients being treated by East Sussex County Hospitals. Of those, a third are being treated in the community. Not one of them is in a high dependency unit. The NHS system in East Sussex coped fantastically last time and has learnt lessons, and this is another important aspect. They've learnt lessons on how to treat people, the oxygen levels uh, required, uh, life saving COVID treatments such as dexamethasone. They have a better understanding on how to treat, and that matters, Madam Deputy Speaker. So when looking at the evidence of the regional lockdown, I just do not believe that we have given it significant time to properly tell us whether it is working or not. Data coming out of University College London suggest that the R rate is close to or at the rate of one, and the words coming out of Imperial College suggest it's too early to tell. The daily average has now gone down to 20,018. And so what that again tells me, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that we should have given more time to determine the regional lockdowns before we shut down other parts of the country where COVID rates, as they are in East Sussex, were low. And then it comes to which path will be the least destructive. And again, I have asked for evidence to show that the destruction and damage caused to people's lives, their livelihoods, will actually be worse off if we did not take these measures. And this evidence has not been provided to me. And it's very difficult to make a decision when we've not got two competing sets of analysis. And I've been asked, Madam Deputy Speaker, have I met anybody who has lost a loved one through COVID? And the answer to that is, tragically, yes, I have. And the heart goes out to them. But I have also attended the funeral of a friend in the last year who took his life, having lost his job. I have met people who have not attended hospital appointments and now have terminal illnesses and wish to goodness they had. I have met people who suffer domestic abuse behind closed doors that is not uncovered. I have met people who have lost their jobs and the roof over their, their heads because they have lost everything in life and they have become destitute. And I have also experienced people with a mental health torture from isolationism and loneliness for which they cannot recover. Those lives matter too. 
and because I cannot see any evidence showing that there could be more of those lives impacted than the lives we saved, I am unable to support and I will vote against these measures this evening. Speaker, this decision facing us today has big implications for how we recover from this pandemic and how we take the people uh, with us. So I'm pleased we are at least having a vote on it, and I've kept an open mind and listened to the debate. And I know the government has a very difficult balance to take, and a judgment call to make based on the clinical advice, what the economy is saying, and what people are saying, what is sustainable for their um, compliance. And let's be clear, there is no risk-free option. It's all about a balance and management of risk. But the advice from clinical experts, I'm afraid, is too often confusing and contradictory. Why is SAGE using predictions of 4,000 fatalities per day, as my right honourable friend from Maidenhead has said, but the actual figure turns out to be 1,000 uh, at most? Why can projections just a couple of weeks uh, or 10 days ago turn out to be so wrong that they have to be revised so sharply? Is not the problem we seem to be conflating scenarios with forecasts too, uh, too often? And where is the clarity over how many of these deaths might reasonably be expected to have been seasonal flu deaths if COVID was not a thing? What weighting is being given to the rise in non-COVID deaths at home because people with cancer, heart disease and other conventional killers uh, are not getting the treatment in hospital which has been reconfigured almost exclusively to deal with COVID, let alone the impact we're seeing on suicide, on stillbirth rates uh, and on um, babies. And now we're talking about a third wave. How many more waves are we going to have? So clearly, Madam Deputy Speaker, the science is not black and white science. And therefore, we really need to look at the impact of all the measures holistically and not just what one set of scientists is telling us. Now, the impact on business is of greatest concern, as many honourable members have said. The hospitality industry being hit hugely. The service industry relying on the hospitality industry almost uh, forgotten. Uh, the already struggling small, apparently non-essential shops just stocked up for Christmas, losing their trade to supermarkets and garden centres uh, up the road. The aviation and uh, in uh, international tourism industry, the impact on travel agents who can't furlough because they've got to work to process the refunds for which they get absolutely no payment at all. Madam Deputy Speaker, for many, this is economic death by a thousand cuts, a salami slicing of business and the resulting redundancies and bankruptcies, reduced wages, uh, will affect the livelihoods and lives of so many of our constituents. At the very least, we should have an economic audit of the impact of lockdown, which feeds into and challenges the scientific uh, advice. And the other crucial factor is what people are prepared to accept and follow, and that is linked to confidence in the explanations which they are being given. And when you see apparent contradictions, like go and exercise, but you can't play golf, you can't play tennis, children can't exercise outside, you can't go to church, then clearly when logic is not being applied to those, people's confidence is uh, trashed. National lockdown is a big step. The science for it is questionable. The business case against it is overwhelming. Why are we doing it at this stage before we've seen the effects of regional lockdowns? So for me, Madam Deputy Speaker, the case is not proven, the measures proposed are not proportionate, and I can't vote for them. Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't know whether it's a, a pleasure or with huge difficulty I follow those two very powerful speeches from my neighbours down in the South East, the member for Bexhill and Battle and the member for East Worthing and Shoreham. Like most people in this chamber, this has been an agonising decision, but it hasn't been made easy by the government or the front bench. By putting forward data that is, has inconsistencies, by putting forward data that has inflated projections, it's been incredibly hard in constituencies like mine, which are very rare near the R rate of one, to explain to them why we need to go into a national lockdown. Many of us fought for the right to have this debate and this vote. The right thing to do by the front bench would have been to share the data that they have that enables them to make those decisions, to share them with us, so we could argue with them amongst our constituencies up and down the country instead of spending all of our time trying to argue with the government and get hold of the data in the first place. Um, as the member for Bexhill and Battle has already laid out, in the South East it's a very different picture. We don't have a huge amount of infection rates, we don't have a huge number of beds overtaken by COVID patients and all of our local health practitioners are explaining to us that that won't be the case either for many months down the line. So, I would have preferred to have seen the tier system. I would have preferred to see the tier system play out for a period of time and to see how it was working. But I keep being told that we need a national decision, a national endeavour. It is one national health service and that the Prime Minister has no other choice 
but to put us into a national lockdown. So I will be reluctantly supporting the government tonight, but with a caveat. I am putting the Minister and the government on 28 days' notice. They have had many months, but now, over that short period, they need to put in place a public health strategy that works for the whole country, not just for the North and the Midlands, but for me in Wildon. That means taking care of the most vulnerable. That's people in my care homes. If we can test, track and trace in Liverpool, I want the same applied to family members who wish to visit their members in care homes. I'm still hearing from my care home staff that they can't get hold of tests and when they do, they're never returned in decent time. And we need real financial analysis of the decisions that we're taking. When people lose their jobs, they lose their security, they lose their homes, it impacts their mental health. It's just more than a job, it's everything else as well. In a short period of time, I just want to raise a point that's been made by many members already. I feel that we are overstepping the mark as a country, as a government, as the Conservative Party by putting down legislation how people live their lives in their private homes. That is not a space we should enter easily. And in my experience, when men, institutions and governments get hold of that power, they give it up very reluctantly. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, there have been many powerful contributions today, not least by my predecessor, my honourable friend for Wealdon and others, stressing the importance of liberties, lives and livelihoods in these difficult decisions the government is taking. The argument for the 28-day lockdown, too, hinges on the capacity and resources of the NHS and the threat nationwide of our hospitals not being able to cope in the season most favourable for the spread of this virus. The national data is convincing and the international evidence compelling, but at a local level, it varies. So my neighbour, the Right Honourable Member for the Forest of Dean, has made the case that it is hard to support restrictions on the lives, livelihoods and liberties of his constituents, given the relatively low numbers of COVID patients there. But the argument that persuades me is that no area ultimately is an island. Those who live in Gloucestershire, whether in the rural or the towns, all depend on the Gloucestershire Royal Hospital in my constituency for ENA treatment of this virus. And while I believe that our hospital does have the staff, ventilators and beds to withstand a second wave on its own, there is a real risk of mutual aid being called, whether for Bristol, Swindon or other cities nearby. And that would increase the scale of the challenge for us considerably. And so, because ultimately the rural areas, wherever they are in our nation, with lower rates of infection, do depend on the hospitals in our cities in their hour of need, we have to accept this temporary new closure with huge reluctance and sadness for what it means for many of our constituents. Now, this bill, a statutory instrument, is not amendable this evening, but I hope that the Secretary of State, who I'm sure is listening hard, and his colleagues will continue to fine-tune the detail and the guidance, because balancing what I called in October the small joys in lives with risks to infection rates is important in a democracy where only consensus and agreement to comply will deliver the result that we all want. The letter in this context from the leaders of all the major faiths is the single largest plea in numbers of lives and well-being touched. The voices supporting visits to care homes, gyms and other things precious to constituents are also important within an acceptance of the second lockdown, and these voices must be heard. In cities like ours, with a cathedral, dozens of churches and handful of mosques and adherents of the Hindu, Jewish and Sikh faiths as well, the freedom to pray is welcome, but the freedom to worship together is one I strongly support, and I urge the Prime Minister to ensure this come back with a return to local tears on December the 2nd. Steve Baker. These are extreme measures for extreme times. I think I found myself agreeing with every word of what my right honourable friends for Altrincham, Sale West and Broxbourne said, but I have forced myself against my instincts to confront the reality of the government's arguments, and I want to say a big thank you to the Secretary of State and to the Prime Minister for giving me a privileged opportunity to take scientists into number 10 to interrogate 
the data. I confess it was as a red team, as I said in public, I was rather hoping that we would take the wheels off the data and thereby stop this lockdown uh, altogether, and I'm sorry that that has not been possible. The best argument for the government's policy is the one I put in a Telegraph article earlier, the, ar the argument that with an R above 1, perhaps to 1.5, from which is you know, a, a level, it's e easier to suppress to 1.5 than below 1, I, I understand. But the, the best argument is that with that plateauing phenomenon, you get uh, intolerable pressure on the NHS. And because Professor Whitty had to, if not correct, then clarify the record of what he said ye yesterday to the Select Committee, I went back to see what my right honourable friend said to me about Liverpool's cases when I intervened on him uh, Monday, I think. And I pay tribute to him because on this complex subject, he did not get it wrong. He got it right. I've checked very carefully and I'm sure he got it right. But the reality is that there are different data sets. If we look at what Professor Tim Spector said, for, he put, tweeted out further evidence today from our ZOE CSS survey that we've passed the peak in the second wave of new cases in the UK. There will be a four-week lag before this is seen in a decline to deaths and one to two weeks in hospitalisation. The R value is close to one in most areas now. But the point I want to make is this. The government's strategy, as advocated by some of the best scientists, it's been my privilege to meet them, relies upon a bet that science will deliver vaccines, improved testing, improved treatments. And I'm delighted that people are optimistic about it. But I'm being asked now to impose the most enormous costs on my constituency and on my country on a bet about science delivering in an environment where there are contested data sets, including a data set which suggests are going below one. And I'm not able to do it. It's with a heavy heart and many misgivings that I will be voting no tonight. And I really wish I had the clarity on either side of the argument which is occasionally held and expressed in this House and much more routinely expressed outside. I want to um, make a point about compliance. If we have this lockdown and it's not complied with, it will be a disaster. We can have no more innovative eye test procedures in the course of this lockdown. There must be compliance and a good example set. In 28 days, I will not behave in the way I have this week. I'll continue to behave responsibly in working with the government. But there will be no equivocation about my views in 28 days. We've got to learn to live with this virus, deliver on the, the new science, reform expert advice, reform modelling, and improve standards in government so that never again do we see a model like this which evaporates like morning mist under the sunlight of close inspection. Yeah. Dr Luke Evans. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And 48 hours ago, I came to the House and asked them to sharpen the axe with regards to the measures being put in place. Today, the House will decide whether to use that axe. This is a Rubicon moment with a national Sophie's choice. If we use it, we are going to impact the biggest uh, impact we have on civil liberties since the war. We're going to cause economic damage, job losses, and mortally wound businesses. There will be mental health problems and will indebt our children and our children's children. On the other hand, do nothing. The NHS surge capacity is likely to be breached. The quagmire of COVID will actually kill off all the non-COVID cancer, stroke and joint operations. More people will be left with long COVID and the staff will be struggling to cope facing burnout, or worse still, literally having to choose between whose mother, father, grandfather or grandmother will get treatment. This is a horror choice for any government, and I think it is right that the 650 representatives from across the country will make this decision. Now, unfortunately, there is no double-blind trial running where there's a second UK where we can see what else is happening. We have to make a judgment call on what we think might happen. So for me, the concern is over the surge capacity. And in the Health Select Committee, we have seen evidence of what happens when this is breached. In Italy, there were many, many oversubscribed beds that people could not get treatment. People over 60 were written off purely on their age. Now, many in the House may well find themselves written off for that very reason. And in Spain, there were nursing homes that were abandoned with people in them. 
We have to take that seriously. And if you think it can't happen here, I ask you to look at the letter you received from the NHS providers this morning that represent all 216 trusts. And they ask us to support this motion as urgent action is needed. Now, I spoke before about we've, this virus has opened Pandora's box and we need hope. That hope comes in ingenuity of vaccines. But until then, I believe our communities will follow the lockdown rules. I believe that the Treasury should continue to actively listen and do its darndest to support businesses and jobs. And I believe that mass testing must be rolled out so that people can get a test and carry on their daily living. And I will support the lockdown, but hold the government to account to mitigate the impact of their using this tool and make sure that we cut down this COVID pandemic. Neil. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a profound moment that we are being asked knowingly to restrict the civil liberties of our fellow citizens to an unprecedented degree in peacetime and knowingly and deliberately to harm the economic welfare and, in some cases, the personal welfare of our fellow citizens, because lockdowns have consequences and lockdowns themselves do damage. And in deciding whether or not that can ever be acceptable in a country that believes in the rule of law, it is important to, believe, to consider whether or not such measures are necessary, are proportionate and are supported by evidence. Well, I accept that the COVID pandemic uh, it is an emergency of a kind that can make such draconian measures necessary. I regret to say, however, that I do not believe that the measures set out in these regulations are either proportionate or based upon the evidence. I do not doubt the Secretary of State and the Government's good intentions, but the details of the measures go beyond that which are appropriate, it seems to me, to achieve the objective uh, that is set out. And I think we could refer, perhaps, uh, to the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Laws briefing and the reference there to the late Sir John Laws uh, and his uh, 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 description of doing that, the minimum which is necessary, in effect, to achieve the objective uh, with the minimum intrusion upon civil liberties. I'm afraid some of the measures here go beyond that. There is no scientific basis uh, for the banning of non-contact uh, outdoor sports. There is no scientific basis for treating grassroots uh, football and community sport differently to elite sports in those fields. There is no scientific basis for preventing and indeed criminalising people of faith going to collective worship when they do so in a safe fashion, foregoing the right to join in uh, communal hymn singing or music to limit the risks of transmission. That goes beyond that which is proportional. There is no economic impact as to the disbenefits to businesses. I have seen family businesses with 20 years standing already go under in my constituency. I cannot vote to support that uh, without clear evidence uh, as to why that is necessary, the extent to that which is likely to continue, and what the plan is to come out of the other side of this in good order. Uh, so, uh, with a heavy heart, I cannot support the government in the lobbies today. Because these measures are not amendable, uh, I uh, would have been prepared to look at a more, restri uh, more limited, more proportionate form of regulations, but it goes beyond it. And an example of the short notice that we've had to consider these measures, the poor drafting of them, is that you're allowed, for example, to go to an estate agent uh, under the regulations, but you cannot go to your solicitor, uh, but the documentation that you will need to get a mortgage and to move house will frequently need to be witnessed in person by the solicitor. These are poorly drafted regulations, and that's a simple and one of only many examples of that, and why I can't support them. Yeah, yeah. Diana Davison. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it's with a heavy heart that I stand today to support the Government's proposals for a national lockdown, which incidentally are supported by 55 per cent of Bishop Auckland residents, according to a local survey I ran this week. But let me begin by making this perfectly clear. The notions of freedom and liberty remain at the core of my values, of my ideology and of my very ethos. And it goes entirely against my instincts to impose restrictions on the freedoms of our residents. I certainly didn't come into politics to tell people why they could leave their homes, who they could visit, whether they could spend time with their families and to tell people they aren't allowed to go out on a first date. Now, this is not a decision that any of us will take lightly, but I believe we must make the choice to do the next right thing and support this four week lockdown. And we know that the next four weeks are going to be difficult. 
I remember all too well the solitude of living on my own during the first lockdown and what that did to my mental state. And that is a tiny speck of nothing compared to what some of our constituents have gone through. People have lost loved ones, either to COVID or to other illnesses that COVID left undetected. And my deepest condolences go out to everyone affected in that way. And mental health, an issue very close to my heart, continues to decline for so many across our communities. And each of us must do all we can to support them in the difficult dark nights ahead. Many businesses are facing unprecedented difficulties. And each of those means a group of employees desperately concerned about their jobs, their livelihoods and their futures. And I must say I'm incredibly grateful to the Chancellor and to the Treasury team for the support that they have put in place. And I urge them to continue to engage with we MPs, with our businesses, with our local authorities and with our individual residents to ensure that we can continue to support as many people as possible through this period of economic hardship. So I hear people ask, how then can I justify voting for these restrictions today? And the answer is because I'm thinking about the future of our freedom. Like all of us, I want to see life return to normal as soon as possible. I want to see children playing with their friends, students celebrating Freshers' Week, and couples having the big weddings of their dreams. And I want to see families able to get together to celebrate Christmas. But to get our freedoms back means biting the bullet now, acting decisively and suppressing the virus through this time-restricted lockdown. We will defeat this virus, of that I am completely confident. We will return to the sunlit uplands of hope, optimism and promise, and we'll be able to refocus all our efforts not on an unexpected global pandemic, but on rebuilding our country, as the PM says, building back better, levelling up those left behind areas and massively increasing opportunities for people in Bishop Auckland and beyond. Madam Deputy Speaker, in order to reach the light, we first have to go through the tunnel. And I know once again that our communities will join hands to make it through this difficult phase. And I know that in doing so, we will eventually emerge into a brighter post-COVID future. Jonathan Ashworth. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, this afternoon, members have spoken with uh, sincerity and eloquence, and I think it's clear that the House uh, the le would have benefited, the legislation, the regulations would have been improved, and indeed our constituents would have expected a full day of debate, because we are invited to endorse a long, hard lockdown, a lockdown which the Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster himself conceded at the weekend could well need to stretch beyond the beginning of September. Now, we on this side will endorse the regulations before the House tonight, because for all the disputes about graphs and modelling, the, the trends are clear. General and acute beds are filling up. Critical care beds are filling, filling up. More people will die over the next two to three weeks because we didn't act sooner. But our constituents will want to know there is a plan, and it is still not clear what the criteria will be used to judge judge whether the lockdown should be lifted? Is it bringing the nationwide R under one? Is it falling hospital admissions? Is it lower prevalence rates amongst the over 60s? Is it a prevalence with which contact tracing is effective? I hope the Secretary of State can answer that. And I want to underline three quick points that members across the House have raised. John Steinbeck wrote, a sad soul can kill you quicker, far quicker than a germ. Now, it's not entirely biologically correct, but we understand the point. Loneliness and isolation extract a heavy mental and physical toll. So will the Secretary of State guarantee that a mental health plan for the winter, and will services continue to be accessible either online or face-to-face? -face? At times of crisis, many of our constituents find solace through faith and communion of congregational prayer. Churches, mosques, temples, gurdwaras, synagogues, have gone to great lengths, often at great cost by volunteers, to make themselves COVID secure. We have Diwali coming up soon. Uh, many mosques have been in touch with me. If indi individual prayer in the church or the masjid is allowed with social distancing in place, then why not congregational prayer? And with respect to social care, I understand the Secretary of State has published some guidance and visits will be allowed outside or behind screens. That is welcome. But perhaps could he use the mass testing that is now coming online to allow relatives to be tested so they can see their relatives inside in the care home and perhaps even hug their relatives? Many will fear that this is the last Christmas for many of their loved ones in care homes. And finally, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what happens next? The Paymaster General yesterday warned of further lockdowns, but a hokey cokey of lockdowns has to be avoided. This virus 
is controllable with the correct measures in place. So we urge the Secretary of State to use these four weeks to quickly expand the saliva testing to all NHS staff and key workers. Secondly, we need tracing teams led locally doing the detective work uh, to identify the super spreading events with retrospective tracing. East Asian countries are avoiding lockdowns with this cluster busting approach. We should institute it here. We need decent sick pay and support for those isolating and we need to improve ventilation systems in public buildings. And finally, we need a plan for Christmas. When the lockdown ends, thousands of students will be travelling the country to go home. What is the government's plan to keep us safe through the, through the Christmas and New Year period? But tonight, we will support these measures. But we are demanding our constituents pay a huge price to make. We are demanding our constituents make greater sacrifice because of a failure to act sooner. Secretary of State Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And these measures that we've just debated are indeed extraordinary measures. In response to an extraordinary threat to our nation's health and prosperity. And the measures do not come easily to me, nor to my bright old friend the Prime Minister, and nor should they to this House. Our historic liberties are hard won and precious, and they should not be infringed save the grave bravest of times. But these are grave times indeed, and if we do not act now, then we know that the NHS could not have been able to cope. And I know that no member of this House wants to see the scenes that we've witnessed elsewhere in the world of hospitals overrun, or of doctors forced to make the choice of who to treat and who to turn away. So we must drive this virus down together and take these tough yet time-limited measures, making sacrifices now for the safety of all. And it won't be easy, I know that, but in a pandemic there are no easy choices. As my honourable friend for Eddersbury put it, we face an invidious choice. We're called upon to make fundamental changes to how we live, work and socialise, but it is in pursuit of a common cause. And while we do so, we must and we will use this time to drive forward the innovations that are going to help us ensure that, if at all possible, this lockdown is the last. The mass testing that's been mentioned by so many, which we've begun to roll out this week and are driving forward night and day. The vaccine, which was mentioned by my on friend, the member for South Wiltshire and others, which, while not yet assured, we will be ready to roll out as soon as we safely can, and the treatments that this country has pioneered. Now, there have been some excellent, excellent speeches, all made with a heavy heart and with regard to the seriousness of the situation. My right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, spoke of the need to assess the impact not only on health but also on the economy. And we know that the economic impact of these measures will be significant. We know that, but we also know that if this virus continues to rise and continues to double, then the economic impact will be serious still more. Many members raise the impact on mental health, and I take this very seriously. I consulted before supporting this decision with the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and they have said that stricter measures to control the virus are needed because the virus itself has a negative impact on people's mental health. And there's a wider point, both for mental health services and more broadly, that the NHS is open. We're determined to ensure that it stays open as much as is possible for non-COVID treatments. And my honourable friend, the member for Bexhill and Battle, for whom I have a huge amount of respect, argued passionately about the impact of the first lockdown on the health services available. And I say to him with all sincerity, it is by tackling the rise in the virus that we will keep the NHS open rather than by allowing the virus to grow. And in his constituency, the number of cases has doubled in the last uh, two weeks, almost doubled. I looked it up uh, as he was speaking. So I would urge him and others who support the NHS so strongly 
to support these measures in order to allow the NHS to continue to do its job. Uh, yes, of course. Monday that one of the lessons from the end of lockdown one was that we didn't insist enough on people isolating when uh, they were contacted by, by test and trace. Going forward at the end of lockdown 2.0, how will we improve on that? Constant, constant need to improve on that. Uh, firstly, the number of people being contacted and who are isolating has risen sharply. Secondly, while of course, of course there's always a need for more, the proportion has started to rise recently and the amount of resources and support that we're giving to the test and trace service uh, continues to grow. So I absolutely support uh, the point that my honourable friend's making, that we must use this month to ensure that that service is there and ready but those who have said that it doesn't have any impact, I think, are wrong. It is having a significant impact on bringing the R down from its natural elevated rate of around 2.5 to where it is today. But with the R above 1, the virus continues to grow, and we must bring it down. Uh, a number of uh, colleagues on all sides of the House raised the issue of communal worship. And my uh, right honourable friend for Gainsborough, uh, my honourable friend for uh, Gloucester, and I can, say, I can tell the House that ministers are talking to faith leaders to do everything we can to reach an accommodation as soon as possible. I understand the impact of this infringement on liberties, as uh, many, many colleagues uh, mentioned. Uh, we saw support for the measures from, uh, from across the House. Uh, the Honourable Member for Aberfan talked about how furlough must be fair for all, and we've extended the furlough system. My Honourable Friend for Wimbledon talked about the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence. And while science, of course, consists of men and women with different views, I truly believe that the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence is in favour of suppressing the virus. Uh, we heard from the, my Honourable Friend for Wealdon, and, uh, and, and Loughborough about how, with heavy hearts, they're supporting these measures. My right hon. friend for Kenilworth and South Southern talked about taking damaging decisions to prevent a disastrous outcome later, and I think that was about right. Um, the members for Reading East and for Blackburn expressed their uh, support, even though they uh, also said that they wished that this had come in earlier. My right hon. friend from uh, East Hampshire and my honourable friend for Bosworth and South West Bedfordshire. They all spoke so eloquently of what it means, that promise that the NHS is always there for you. It's something that binds us together as a country, and it's something that we must protect and cherish. Um, the, the issue of care homes was raised, including by the honourable a member for the front bench opposite. Um, the visitor guidance uh, was published, updated visitor guidance was published this morning, and I agree with him about seeking the further expansion of testing for care homes, including for, uh, for visitors. Uh, there was a widespread debate about the need for more pi data publication. All I can say is that we, we're constantly expanding the data that's being published. More, more, more and more data from the NHS on hospitalizations, more and more data on cases and where they are, contact tracing data. Um, so I, I am absolutely enthusiastic about publishing more and more data. We have indeed been commended uh, as a country uh, for the open approach that we're taking in terms of the amount of data uh, that is published. Um, but ultimately, this comes to a very significant judgment. It comes to a judgment about how we best manage a nation and lead a nation through an incredibly difficult period with a pandemic who ex which of a virus that exists only to multiply and a virus that lives and breathes off the essence of what it is to be human. The, my honourable friend, the member for Broxbourne, spoke with a passion of freedom, and I too am a lover of freedom, but I also care about protection, and it is the combination of the two that we must uh, balance and address. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, in ordinary times, these measures would be unimaginable. But these are not ordinary times. It's a virus in circulation that feeds off the human contact that makes life worth living. And we must act to thwart its deadly march, to protect our NHS, and to save countless lives. While we support every person, 
and with everything we've got, support the science that with increasing confidence each day, I know will help us to find a better way through. And I commend these regulations to the House. Order. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. No. Division, no. clear the lobby. Order, honourable members, apart from front benches, should be leaving this chamber by the doors behind me, please. We must try to keep social distancing going, and it's simply wrong for people to leave. Order, other than front benches, everyone should be leaving by the doors behind me.